Aye. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back on the record in independent Thanks. cab. And I believe, I believe Mr. Ackerman, you are going first. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jerry, am I okay to? Yeah. No. So you're getting ready to use the PowerPoint? Yes. So ladies and gentlemen of the public, if you are online, you need to stay online or get back online because uh, the PowerPoint is going to be shown. And if you're not online when it begins in count, uh, countdown to 10, um, you won't be able to participate uh, here. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, <laughs> One that got the other guy. We have ignition. Can we put it on this screen? So I don't know what where she can put. I just, um, do we need to turn around to see it? Yeah, for the purposes of logistics, may I suggest that you push the <coughs> table a little bit forward, the two tables, so you can turn around? And see well, I was, I was hoping that I could face you and you could watch it over my shoulder. Uh, I don't know that she can do that. Well, no, I can see this one. Yeah, she thought it was going to test her. I'm going to try. <laughs> She's going to give it a college try and erase all those people. This reminds me of my last jury trial, trying to do something technical. <laughs> it always works well, doesn't it? Hell, that's a me. And then the judge goes off the bench and says, call me when you guys get this all fixed. You can only stand up by the slap mark in front That's true. Like being a judge. Mm -hmm. Must be great being a judge. Yeah. I'm not sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's just a moment. <clears throat> and there's just kind of judge mark. Yeah. Ah, maybe. Okay. Something's happening. If possible, all, all the screens, that would be. Now you might be asking. More than the legislature is paid for. Why don't we, I know it's not perfect, but we'll proceed. Okay. And, and I'll uh, kind of look halfway. <laughs> it just popped up on the digital billboard on Sahara. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> I just need the clicker back, Jerry. I know, we're, well, I have to, we have to get on. No. Yeah, I did, but it's uh, no. not like Resumes. Clicker works? Clicker works. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, uh, members of the board. My name is Mark Trafton. As you know, I represent Whittlesey and Henderson Taxi, uh, interveners in this matter. As you recall, uh, back in August, uh, when we started this hearing, um, in my opening statement, I referenced the IRAC method which in law school, we, us lawyers learned, uh, the IRAC method stands for issue, rule, uh, application, and conclusion. Um, the issue in this case uh, was at the beginning and remains to this day, 
Uh, should you as a board grant the certificate of public convenience and necessity to independent cab companies? Uh, the rules in this case are there are three of them. Uh, Mr. Carson referenced all three of them. I'm going to talk about the same rules and the evidence that we've heard. Uh, these are the three rules that are in play here. Um, the application uh, of those rules will be all the evidence that you've heard, all the evidence that's been submitted. Uh, I'm just going to highlight some of the evidence uh, in my closing arguments. And the conclusion is simply the answer to the issue. Yes or no? Do you grant the certificate of public convenience? The first rule that I'm going to talk about is NAC 706.453. Um, as you can see at the very beginning of this regulation, it states the burden of proof by, con by clear and convincing evidence is upon the applicant to satisfy the authority of his or her suitability to receive a certificate, and the applicant must demonstrate, and there are five elements. But before I get to those five elements, I want to talk very briefly about what is clear and convincing evidence. Uh, lucky for us, the United States Supreme Court has told us exactly what that means. Clear and convincing evidence in the case of Colorado versus New Mexico, uh, 467 U.S. 310, 1984 case, 1984 case um, the court, I'm, I'm summarizing the court's reference to clear and convincing evidence because it's kind of lengthy, um, but essentially here is what they said. When a party has the burden of proving something by clear and convincing evidence, it means that the party must present evidence that leaves you with a firm belief or conviction that it is highly probable that the factual contentions are true. This is a higher standard of proof than proof by a preponderance of the evidence. We contend as interveners and urge this board that the applicant has not met the clear and convincing standard of proof regarding two of the five elements in NAC 706.453. The two elements are going to be highlighted in yellow. I'm going to click all the way to get all five elements up here. Or I'm sorry, it's just the two. OK, so the two that we are uh, contending are A and D in the actual regulation. The first one is the financial ability of the applicant to provide continuous service. Now I'm going to be uh, candid here. We don't really, as interveners, know all the facts because a lot of the financial information has been submitted to you, the board, on a confidential basis. But here's what we do know. What we do know is what the evidence uh, revealed in the, in the hearing, in the evidence uh, that was proffered by Mr. Balaban, that of the three performance that have been produced to this board, um, or business plan, or whatever you want to call them, plans, or um, financial uh, speculation, or however Mr. Carson wants to characterize it. Um, on the best day or best case scenario, according to Mr. Balaban, independent cab company is going to lose at a minimum, whether it's the lease model, $50,000 a month. If it's the employee model, it's going to lose $100,000 to $125,000 a month. Now, this regulation part A comes into play because does independent cab company have the financial ability to provide continuous service when they're losing that kind of mon money on a monthly basis? That's a legitimate question, a legitimate issue that I'm, I'm sure you're gonna grapple with. Have they proven by clear and convincing evidence that they can provide on a financial basis that they can provide continuous service? We submit to you that that's, that's probably a close call on your part. Subsection D, we submit to you that he has not, they have not satisfied the burden by clearing convincing evidence that they have sufficient experience or have employed persons with sufficient experience to properly manage a taxicab company. 
Let's take a look at the evidence that's been submitted regarding this element D of section 706.453. Neither Mr. Carson or his wife, Claudia, have ever worked as a cab driver. They've never worked for a cab company. They've never hired anyone that's worked for a cab company. They didn't produce anybody before you that's worked for a cab company. You have no resumes of anybody that they may hire to work for the cab company. The only reference we now have of anybody that may work for a cab company, their cab company, are the two individuals without names submitted on one of the performance. When I asked questions about these two individuals, I understood he wasn't going to give me the names, but I asked, do they have experience managing a taxi cab company? Why was I asking that? Because of this regulation. His answer was, I don't know. So the application and the evidence as it stands before you, the applicant doesn't know if the people that they want to work for them have any experience with a taxi cab company. Well, that certainly doesn't clear the clear and convincing evidence burden of proof. So what does Mr. Carson say when we've asked him about these types of things? Well, I can handle it. I can do it. I have experience. I'm a lawyer that's represented taxi cab companies for 20 years. I have no criticism of Mr. Carson as a lawyer. In fact, I think he's a good lawyer. I've had cases against him through the years. We've worked on the same side of cases. He's an excellent lawyer. He's proven that here throughout this hearing. He's a passionate lawyer. But your analysis is not of Mr. Carson, the lawyer. Your analysis is of Mr. Carson, the hopeful taxi cab certificate holder. And I submit to you that he hasn't given you enough proof to satisfy this burden of proof in 706.453. In sum, regarding this 453, he's failed to produce clear and convincing evidence that can provide continuous service while losing possibly upwards of $100,000 a month and have failed to produce clear and convincing evidence that the applicant has sufficient experience or has employed people with sufficient experience to properly manage a taxi cab company. The next rule is obviously the big one, NRS 706.8827. I want to just focus on this sentence for a second because I have it capitalized. Each and every one of the requirements below must be satisfied. I'm just going to click through all of them and then we're going to take each one in turn. The applicant has to prove he's fit, willing, and able. That the proposed operation will be consistent with the legislative policies in 706.151. The granting of the certificate will not unreasonably and adversely affect the other carriers. The holders of the existing certificates will not meet the needs. And finally, the proposed service will benefit the public and the taxi cab business in the territory to be served. So we're going to take each one of them one by one. This is obviously one of the big components in 8827. Is the applicant fit, willing, and able to perform the services of the taxi cab carrier? We're going to spend a few minutes talking about fitness and then we're going to talk a little bit about ability. Of course, he's willing. He's here. He's been through this for three years. We're not contesting his willingness to participate as a taxi cab carrier. The real question is fitness. Mr. Carson, let's look at the evidence, okay, that you've heard from the testimony and the documentary evidence. Mr. Carson has admitted that he had to be educated by the interveners what was necessary to complete a performer. Ninety percent plus of the information, the changes that he made to the amended performer was gained from the interveners. Even after being educated, 
he still hasn't completed a realistic and profitable performance. He did not perform a cash flow analysis. He offered no market backup for anything that he has submitted as, as what he's going to do. No documentation or commitments from any financing sources. No documentation on how he's going to purchase vehicles for the price that he says he's going to purchase them. You've all heard testimony how difficult it is to purchase vehicles. He's offered no evidence, nothing about that. During the first por portion of this hearing back in August, Mr. Winter questioned Mr. Carson about how he's going to pay people $10 an hour to come work for his company for only four hours a day. Mr. Winter's question specifically was, how are you going to get somebody to come work, drive their car to work for $10 an hour for four hours of work? Mr. Carson responded, people are desperate. I don't know. Mr. Winter said, you're going to hire desperate people. Mr. Carson said, I don't care who I hire. This is testimony from the applicant on Tuesday, August 16th, on page 12 of transcript B on that day. Regarding the $4,000 that he proposes that he's going to pay to rent a facility, he was questioned about that. What are you going to get for $4,000? Mr. Carson's response, I don't know the answer to that. That's from the same day on page 14 of that transcript. Regarding what the current market rate is for hiring mechanics, Mr. Gibson asked Mr. Carson if he knew what the rate is. Mr. Carson said, no, he doesn't have any idea. That's from the same day on page 18 of that transcript. You've heard Mr. Carson repeatedly reference his affiliation or ownership with Las Vegas Limousine. He is not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of Las Vegas Limousine. In fact, he doesn't even know how the drivers for Las Vegas Limousine are paid. I asked him questions about that during his, uh, my examination, my cross-examination. I said, how are they paid? He tried to explain to me, but when I pressed him for the details between minimum wage commission. He said, I'm not exactly sure. I apologize. The applicant literally has produced no evidence where independent cab is going to be located. Nobody knows. He seems to act as he's just going to figure things out as he goes along. <clears throat> if he gets the certificate, then he'll deal with things as they come along. He's literally winging it. He has no plan. He has no structure. We've all pressed him for details and we just haven't gotten them. This is a recipe for disaster. This applicant is not fit to become a certificate holder because after being educated by the interveners, after three tries, the applicant still can't come up with a plausible business plan. He testified he doesn't care who he hires. He has no plan for a business location. He has no cl clue what a business location will cost. The applicant is not fit to become a holder of a certificate of public convenience and necessity. Is he able to become, to perform the services of a taxi cab motor carrier? My clients contend it's highly doubtful that an applicant will be able to operate this company while losing 50 to $100,000 a month. The evidence is overwhelming. He will be operating this company at a substantial loss every month. It's highly doubtful the applicant possesses the bandwidth to go and unlock the doors every day and manage the day to day operations. When I questioned him at this hearing about his law practice and during his deposition, by the way, about his current law, his law practice. It's a full-time business for him. He runs it, he manages the cases. He has 50 active cases that are going to become litigation cases. He has 50 clients that he represents in front of the NTA, tow truck drivers, what have you. And I just assumed that he would discontinue his law practice because he wants to spend full time doing this. 
And he said, no, why would I do that? That would be ridiculous. Do you really believe that he's going to be able to do all of this? The evidence is not there. He has literally not submitted one person to this board that has any experience either working at a taxi cab company. I don't care if it's a manager. He could have hired a taxi cab driver to come before you and say, hey, I have some really good ideas. He didn't do that. Not one person that has any taxi cab experience. From, I mean, you've heard testimony from all of our clients. They work from the ground level up. Why not find somebody like that to come in, pay him $10 an hour? He didn't do it. With the evidence submitted to this board, as, it, as the record stands by this applicant, the applicant will not be able to perform the services of a taxi cab motor carrier. The next element, uh, the proposed operation will be consistent with the legislative policies set forth in 706.151. This is what uh, the first line says. It's hereby declared to be the purpose and policy of the legislature in enacting this chapter. I'm just going to highlight uh, a, a small portion of the language. There it is. Um, I'm focusing on to promote safe and adequate service and foster sound economic conditions in motor transportation. I think this board gets the message that it will not be sound economic conditions if this applicant six months down the road has to close up shop because he's losing 50 to $100,000 a month. I think this board got the message from Mr. Balaban, if you're bleeding cash every month, what are you going to do? You're going to start making cuts. If you start making cuts, what's going to happen? Customer service is going to suffer. The drivers are going to start doing things they're not supposed to be doing. Some safety corners are going to get cut. That is not good to promote safe transportation. <coughs> Again, these are elements he has to prove. And the proof is actually the opposite. The next element, the granting of the certificate will not unreasonably and adversely affect other carriers. The applicant literally proposes nothing new to this industry. Independent cab just wants to come in and grab a piece of the pie. The application, if granted, will adversely affect the other carriers. This is especially true if independent cab company starts to cut corners. I think you've heard from several different people that if a customer has bad service with one taxi cab company, they're going to plaster the entire industry as, as a bad industry. Taxi cabs in Las Vegas are terrible. Um, if independent cab company goes into survival mode and start cutting corners, we're all going to feel the negative impacts from that. That's going to be the adverse impact to the other carriers. The next element, the holders of the existing certificates will not meet the needs of the territory. Each company has testified through their respective witnesses that they are more than willing to meet the needs. The companies have long been meeting the needs and will continue to do so. You heard testi testimony from Ms. Gibbons. She, she pulled the statistics of the number of complaints made. I mean, that is hard evidence. People file complaints with the tax cab authority. We have no control over that. And the percentages are so, so low of the complaints. In other words, people are generally satisfied. Now, are, they, are there going to be situations where people are not thrilled or they have to wait a little longer when an event comes out? Yes, that happens, okay? But overall, the, the industry does a, a phenomenal job of satisfying the needs of the riding public. They are, the industry is continually trying to improve the service that they're providing, whether it's um, 
installing video cameras. I can remember back when that was a big, big discussion. Um, also, the, the Cabot program. There are buttons now throughout Las Vegas, the Valley, restaurants, bars, hospitals, um, medical offices, where you can push the button and get a cab to your location quickly. That was an effort to improve the service, to meet the needs of the traveling pub public. The evidence is there. Mr. Carson, um, to, to argue about this point, proffered some photographs of people standing in line at a taxi cab stand. We proffered the opposite evidence. <laughs> of course, there are going to be situations where there are tons of cabs and no people, and there are going to be situations where there are people and no cabs for hopefully a couple of minutes, and it's not gonna be very long. But the instances where there are tons of people and no cabs are far and few between. It's not a regular part of day-to-day day -day life in the taxi cab industry in Las Vegas. It's just not. Much of Mr. Carson's opening focused on what's coming to Las Vegas, what's coming in 2023, and we're going to need more transportation. The existing certificates, certificate holders are willing to meet those needs. They want to meet those needs. There's been no evidence that they won't meet those needs. Each of the companies have proffered testimony that they are willing, they are working diligently to purchase more vehicles. You've heard that testimony. We're, we're doing the best we can to get the vehicles. We're recruiting drivers from outside of the industry to bring in new people, and we're having some success at that. That's evidence that we're looking forward to satisfy the needs of the public going forward. And if there are more medallions needed, then we will come before the board and ask for another allocation so that everybody gets an equal allocation. The existing certificate, certificate holders will meet the needs. Final element, and I'm wrapping up, the proposed service will benefit the public and the taxi cab business in the territory to be served. With the evidence before you, I, I don't see how you cannot conclude that what he's proposed in the business plan is a financial loser. This would be a disaster for the public, the taxi cab industry as a whole. If this certificate is approved, an independent company fails, as it's very likely to do, it'll be terrible for this industry. The territory is currently already being served adequately. The proposed service will add nothing to benefit the public and the taxi cab business in general. The applicant is offering nothing unique, nothing different. How will this benefit the taxi cab industry or the, or the riding public? It won't. In closing, in addition to my comments a little bit earlier regarding NAC 706.453, NRS 706.8827, which we've just gone through, requires the applicant prove each and every one of the five elements I've just discussed. The applicant can't prove one of them. As such, the application should be denied. Thank you for your time. Next. I think it's me, <clears throat> Bob Winter. Um, if I say something you think is unkind, um, I apologize. And also to uh, the applicants, um, charge it to my head, not my heart. As long as it's not again about Mr. Soderbergh. We've <laughs> <laughs> had enough about him. <laughs> better check that, better cross I'm it out. I'm going to take that out of my clothes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I take no pleasure in being here, but uh, I, I have a job to do, and George is paying me to do it. Um, 8827 was written a long time ago. Um, when I first came around in these rooms, um, the industry was very different. The reason why you see the words territory in so many of them is because most cabs were limited in territory in Clark County. Um, but this is the law, and this is what you apply, and that's your duty. I think the strongest evidence uh, that's been put forth by the applicant is that uh, um, both um, Brent and Claudia are good people, and they are. I, I know them well. Well, I know Brent very well. 
Um, I do want to go through some history and things that we know about this. And I don't want to repeat the same things. I might cite to a couple things to remind you um, um, about the review. What we know, as George has testified and um, Brent Carson has admitted, is before this was filed, Brent sought out George and told him, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. Now, he doesn't remember what the advice was. He remember doing that, but he doesn't remember what was said. George does. He said, oh, please don't do this. Uh, you, you have no idea. I mean, the, the, the things we have to go through now, put your money somewhere else. A small cab company like 35, it, it won't pencil out. I know this. Um, so Mr. Carson sought out the wisdom of Mr. Balaban, which I think is a good idea. Um, had I, um, and I've had experience, legal experience in these rooms, um, had I had that notion, I would certainly sought him out. But let me rephrase, not I, but any reasonable person would seek out George Balaban or somebody's advice about this application to see if it makes sense. I mean, the kinds of things George has testified to, I'm sure never even occurred to the applicant. Didn't occur to me until he said it. Oh, yeah, wow, you know, right? Okay, I'm with you. Three percent here. Got to do this. Um, rather than heed that advice, or he forgot it, um, the history in this case shows that what he did was file for it, and hoping, I believe, that he's a good guy and everybody knows him. And come on, guys, it's only one percent. And those are all three fine points. After filing the application, which had exhibits in there and a pro forma, and every pro forma that was done is detailed. It's got lists of income and expenses, and at the bottom, there's a profit. Everyone. Did uh, Mr. Carson ask George Balaban to review that before filing? No. Um, would a reasonable person do that? Would a reasonable person ask for some advice from someone of his experience or any experience? What do you think? How's this look? Am I missing something? Instead, I believe uh, Brent Carson, the attorney who knows the law here, he filed the application and set forth to try to get the interveners thrown out. So there would be testimony, wouldn't be questions. There'd be before you this application with a pro forma that on its face looks good. Um, this board reversed the initial decision and allowed us in here, and we appreciate that. Um, and I think in the end, uh, applicants are going to appreciate that. The uh, red herring, as Mr. Carson calls it, is the, the performance. Now, I read through them, and I gloss over. My eyes are going to fall asleep. But George can read this stuff, and he can say, this is missing. You know, he just doesn't understand this. I mean, on the revenue lease model, um, we had uh, 850, this, the second lease model, $850 per week. Okay, we're increasing revenue. That's good. Um, that's under what George is charging. Maybe a boutique. Okay. I'm also going to do double shifts, so they're going to share it. And that, on the paper, looks good. I'm generating another $400,000. That's good. But when you ask questions about it, the, the, just the common sense things about how you run a business, cab business, how is that going to work out? The guy who says, give me that cab for a week for 850 bucks, and he gets it for the whole week. But the other guy's got to pay another $850, and he only gets it half the time. That's never going to happen. Well, are the shared leases over at uh, Virgin Valley? Yeah. Well, you, you got to get that price down, and they got to share it, but it's, it's more like half. So you're really not gaining anything. And George points out, you take away the 400 some thousand dollars that's on this extra shared lease, the thing's way upside down. You're losing 50 grand a month. On the employee model, $10 an hour for a cab, it's almost as if these pro formas were written as he said backwards, I thought. Originally, Mr. Carson said to you, I wrote down what my revenue would be, and then I worked from there. 
And when he put all the numbers in, there was a profit. But when you look at them and, and question these assumptions, um, it, it falls apart. 1938 revenue per trip. This is the employee model. That's good. But you can't keep the excise tax in there and the airport fee as your own revenue. That passes through. So now you're $26,000 less a month. Has a bunch of shifts in there at 50 shifts. George says to you, and maybe you don't believe him. He says, I'm getting 40 shifts out, and I'm running Virgin Valley about as tight as I can. So he's going to outperform me without a base of leasers ready to go. Even if you drop him that much, that's another $380,000, another $125,000 a month. The the assumptions, and I, I grant to applicant that these are assumptions, but the reason why you're supposed to look at fitness and sound economic conditions and you require a pro forma is to see if it makes sense. Is this a good idea? And after some scrutiny, all of the pro formas end up losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think the best pro forma with some of the least criticism, he was losing an additional 50,000 a month. It's not sustainable. Now, in asking questions, we know he met with George. The first fellow was Friedman, uh, who was supposedly going to run things, and he has some transportation experience. Did you talk to the Friedman guy and help go through the pro forma? At least he's got some transportation experience. <coughs> no. I think it was the last pro forma. There's two, quote, highly qualified people at the ready, but the name. Did you ask either of them to help you with your pro forma to look through this? Does it make sense? No. Uh, Mr. Carson's phraseology, a good leader gets good people around him. But a good leader knows what questions ask, doesn't he? I think the evidence here demonstrates that this is an unsound and uh, unworkable plan. It's not highly um, probable, but the facts are true as required by 453. The sound economic conditions, I think, are one of the reasons why you require pro forma, but it's one that has to stand up. And I don't know if any of you could have pointed out this. I couldn't have. We know that uh, Mr. Carson couldn't because he didn't know. He didn't ask anybody. The evidence demonstrates, I suggest to you humbly, that Mr. Carson is interested in obtaining a certificate. He is not interested in running a cab business. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Keith Gibson on behalf of Nevada Yellow Cab, Nevada Checker Cab, and Nevada Star Cab. Uh, I join in the sentiments of Mr. Trafton and uh, Mr. Winter and I incorporate those without restating all of those, but I'm going to focus on a couple of points primarily. Um, getting to 8827, if one leg of those five elements is not met, the application fails. So, Brick Carson, they have to prove that they meet all five requirements, and there's two specific ones where they where they fall short. The first one you've already heard about from Mr. Trafton, but I want to highlight some extra testimony about that, and it's the applicant is fit, willing, and able to perform the services of a taxi cab motor company. Getting to the fitness, when we've talked about the performer and we've talked about some things, um, and when I, going back to August, I had asked him about the airport and whether he contacted the airport to figure out what he needs to do to operate at the airport and to see if they have any additional insurance requirements, and his answer is no. He didn't, he never contacted the airport. Now, how, why is the airport important? Because that's where the bulk of our rides come from, period. I mean, between the airport and the strip. And how do you know this? The TA's own statistics show it. Because if you look at what happened in 2020 when the state shut down, we went from having rides of 14.9 million in 2019 down to 5.2 million, which is by far, you know, that's 80% reduction from the peak of roughly 2014. In 2014, 
the industry did 27.6 million rides. That's what this industry is capable of doing with this number of medallions, with this number of operators. The industry can do 27.6 million rides if the demand is there. Unfortunately, we all know the struggles that all of the taxi cab companies have had with Uber and Lyft. And there are people now who, because of their addiction to their phone and their addiction to everything has to be here, has to be, they, they go on, they, it's Uber and Lyft. They don't even think about, oh, there are taxi cabs at the, at the, you know, downstairs at the hotel. Now, why that is and why they think that way, it's because that's the way it is in every other, in every other city. Most other cities don't have a line of taxis right outside every hotel downtown. They have a few, maybe one or two. They don't have a line of six, 10, 15 sitting there waiting to grab people coming in and out of a show or in and out of dinner or convention or whatever. But that's what makes Vegas unique, which is why Vegas has been able to do, you know, ranging from 22 to 27 million trips going back all the way from 2003 to you know, 2015 when Uber and Lyft really began to operate. And then what happened when Uber and Lyft began to operate? The first year wasn't really that bad. The first year, there was a small drop, less than a half a percent. Not a bad drop between 2014 and 2015 when Uber was first approved. But as we've learned and history has shown, the next year, 16 point from 2015, you know, 2015 or 2014, excuse me, to 2016, there was a 16% reduction. From 2014 to 2017, a 27% reduction. And if you go all the way down to 2020, which is by far the worst year in the taxi cab industry, we are talking an 80% reduction in the number of rides. Last year was a bad year compared to 2020. You know, we you know we we did 11,000 rides. We doubled the number of rides in 2020. Granted, in 2020, we pretty much hit rock bottom. You know, at that point, you know, there was no gaming for better part of six months, seven months. Nobody was coming to Vegas and we were struggling. Every company, you heard Mr. Watt testify, we're still recovering. You know, or I should say when he, during his opening uh, closing statement, that's what we're coming back from. You know, we're trying to do the best we can to meet the needs of the industry, which leads to, this, to the second problem, where I think he, the application fails. The holders of existing certificates will not meet the needs of the territory for which the certificate is being sought. All the testimony from Cheryl, from George, as well as M Mike Valen, they talked about all the steps that they're trying to do to meet the needs of the territory. And stated in the reverse, for you to grant the application, you have to find that the existing CPC and holders are not meeting the needs. So all the work that they're trying to do, and across the board and all the hours they put in trying to hire drivers, pull them away from Uber and Lyft, bring new people into the industry. Those are all steps being taken to meet the needs of the industry. And just, and what is the sole evidence to the contrary is some photographs at the World of Concrete Convention Center in February of 2021, which is right after, in the midst of the pandemic. And there were some, and there were some taxi lines, people in the taxi lines. That's the only evidence there is on behalf of Mr. Carson, that the needs aren't being met. And in the Handicap versus Nevada Transportation Authority, the Nevada Supreme Court says have not does not mean will not. And the standard is will not. And so you, the board would have to find that the existing CPC and holders will not meet the needs. And all of the evidence weighs heavily in favor of the current CPC and holders meeting the needs and doing all the steps necessary. Now, there were some, dis uh, I have to comment on something that Mr. Awad said. When YCS purchased the Frius assets and purchased the medallions, there was a big issue with YCS having more than 49% of those medallions. There was a, the additional medallions were never allocated. The, those three medallions per company were never allocated. What happened was YCS basically said, we're not going to take 12 medallions. So that way YCS would stay under the requisite medallion count. And that's the reason why YCS has approximately 48.96% of the medallions. It says about as close to 49% as you can get. And that's what YCS has. And so, so there's not, 
there were no additional medallions. But what have we shown? We're still meeting the needs of the end, of the riding public. And there was talk about uh, testimony about how we have to balance the needs of the drivers as well as the riding public. That's in every business. You know, you, there's a supply and demand, and you have to make sure we have first to have drivers. The drivers have to be able to support themselves. They're, they're, we have two customers. We have the customers that are the riding public, and we also have the customers that are our drivers. And the drivers have to be able to earn a living because if it's not profitable for them to work, they're not going to come to work. Or if they're coming to work, they're going to give horrible service and they're going to give you know, a bad reputation to taxi cab drivers, which we already try to overcome every time we come in, someone new comes in. And why? Because we care about the riding public. And we want to provide the best service we can. You heard about Mike and Balin when he testified about all the steps that he does to make the drivers, you know, a uh, better driver, not just on the customer service side, but also, hey, don't have any so many dead miles. So if you go downtown, don't drop, you know, don't go all the way back to MGM to pick up your next ride, you know, kind of grab something along the way. And that's just good business model because if the, if the meter's not running, we're not making money and the taxi cab's not, you know, getting its fares either. And so I submit to you that based upon all the evidence that the applicant is a fails to meet the requirements of 8827 and specifically those two elements because the, all it takes is one element and he fails to meet the burden on both of those elements. Thank you. Just a correction for the record. That's oh, one. correction for the record. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that I had made a statement regarding the new 27 medallions. I didn't. Uh, that's not me. That's Mr. Mr. Carson. Mr. Carson. I'm sorry, Mr. Carson. I, I apologize. I just, oh, okay. just give it a light, though. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. You don't want to take responsibility for that. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. You don't want to know about the 27 medallions. <laughs> no. Carson, you're about. Yeah. I just yeah, I want to come again. Uh, Thank you for that. Sorry. Thank you again. I might as well start where Mr. Gibson kind of left off. Um, I guess he has kind of selective memory as to the evidence that I presented. Uh, every month, gaming is breaking new records. Every month, McCarran Airport, Perry Reed is breaking new records. That's all part of the record. Last time I checked, direct testimony was evidence. So to say that there's nothing to show that there's an increase in demand is uh, a little sketchy at best. But this protectionist attitude that they have is what caused a vacuum for Uber and Lyft to succeed. We're not going to let anybody in. We're going to fight you tooth and nail. Here we are. We're going to fight you, make you do this, expend attorney fees, everything like that, so we can drag you out to where you give up. And it worked. There hasn't been an application approved in 21 years. Why? Because of the last thing they made these people go through. Everybody still remembers it. Mr. Awad said, oh, I made a choice to be attorney and applicant. Hell yeah, I did. I couldn't afford me to be sitting here in front of you. I've spent 400, maybe 500 hours from February of 2019 to today on this application. Preparing the exhibits, preparing the financials, answering discovery, doing subpoenas, everything, sitting in the hearings, go to the hearing officers. I was paying somebody, I'm out $200,000. They know that. They know that. They grind you. And I wouldn't be here if I wasn't confident in my abilities to get this application through. Again, I put my money where my mouth is. Every hour I take away, I'm a sole practitioner. Every hour I take away to do this job for this application is an hour that I'm missing with my clients. Not everybody has that luxury. I can pick and choose. That's what I chose. But to sit here and be scolded or reprimanded because I know what I'm doing, I'm trying to do my best, Trying to do what's best for my family. That's what I've been dealing with for three years. And I said it before, it's offensive. It is. If you had somebody said, why would you be sitting in the same room with somebody for three years calling you an idiot? 
You wouldn't. Every time I just get over bite my tongue and go this. So I'm glad it's over. You know, I'm I'm glad I'm glad. You know, you guys are gonna come to your decision and you're gonna base it upon everything that you've heard. But let's talk about the position of superiority versus the little guy. I don't have a company. I've got a name, independent cab. I've got no employees. I don't have a car. I don't have a location. Yeah. Because what if you guys say, no, Brent, you didn't meet your standards. Did I just buy 35 cars and now I got to go turn and flip them? Did I go sign a lease that I can't get out of for three years? They say I'm not a financial guy and I can't figure this out. <laughs> That's financial. That's like, why would I go expend money when I don't have anything yet? They want to say that's no preparation. I didn't waste, I didn't go and look at this, I didn't go and do that. It would be stupid for me to. Plain and simple. Everything. Most of it, everything is talking about pro forma. So pro forma's numbers are off. He's stupid. He doesn't know what he's doing. I understand. Guess what? I did my best. But I can tell you this, former chief Ruben Aquino asked for my financial data on the company that I do own and operate 34 limousine SUVs and sedans. You have that in front of you. 34 vehicles, can I run 34 vehicles and make a profit? What do those records say? Of course I can. What are they gonna tell you? I can't make it in this business. I've proven otherwise. I am picking up passengers. I am taking them to their destination. Right now, as we sit in this room, my company is doing that. And you know what? It has expenses, but it also has a profit. So whatever number I would have thrown down on this pro forma, it's not going to be good enough. Not for them. And even if it was a perfect pro forma, they would have intervened anyway, because there is no need for additional medallions. That's their position. There's no need. Now, if you believe Brian Bonifant, and if you believe Tig Siegerblum, who's probably one of the most smartest guys in the, uh, count, in the county as it comes to the economic uh, development of Clark County, and he's saying that there's a, going, there's a need now, and there's a need coming up in the future. If you believe those two witnesses, there is a need. If you believe that Allegiant Stadium is a disaster and it's been up for a couple of years now, nothing has been done to fix that. They just ignore it like it's the plague. Yet, Allegiant Stadium has brought Las Vegas. I'm baffled. I think it's one of the, the greatest things that we've done for the city, and I've lived here my entire life. It's opened up doorways for every business in every category, every industry in Clark County. It's bringing international people. It's bringing a new, new tourist to this valley. And how should we meet them? We should meet them with open arms and give them a good, a good uh, memory. Las Vegas is good for that. Everybody comes here, likes to have fun, remembers their Vegas trip. Don't tarnish it. Um, I think uh, Mr. Winter said that I would will grow to appreciate the intervention. I don't think I ever will. I won't appreciate the interveners. I appreciate that, what they've gone through, and they have my respect. We talked in evidence. ACAB started with 16 cars. Arrested. And you know what? ACAB couldn't go to the strip and they couldn't go to the airport. 21 years later, they're still operating. 16, last time I checked, is lower than 35 and limited geographically. 
to the place Mr. Gibson called the best place, the airport, for all of his cab companies. ACAB couldn't even go there. Couldn't pick up. Couldn't pick up on the strip. Was over here in Summerlin at the JW Marriott or the Suncoast or something like that. And you know what? He scrapped. And I guarantee he had some growing pains. But is he still here? Yeah. Is he still operating? Yeah. They said it would never happen. And you know how why? It's because I was sitting in that room when they said that he could never make it. This is deja vu all over again for me. I'm hearing the exact same things that they said 20 years ago, and it doesn't make sense then, it didn't make sense now. Uh, Mr. Winter asked me about preparing the pro forma before talking to Mike Friedman. The application was filed before I spoke to Mr. Friedman. That's pretty much the reason I didn't talk to him about helping me with the pro forma. The application was already in. Um, the, I think he admitted that it is possible to share lease. He doesn't agree with my method of calculation. So be it. I understand. I get his point. Move on. Mark Drafton for the Whittlesey in Henderson. You know, he read you the, the, uh, the law and it says we need to clear and convincing, present evidence, firm belief, you know, clear and convincing. My evidence must have firm belief that it's highly probable. That only applies to NAC 706-453. That's the standard. Now, can I tell you on letter B that it's highly probable that I've never been convicted of a felony or a moral torpitude? I can say that with the highest probability. You have my background. You have my FBI search. We are not associated or controlled by a person with an unreasonable or unsuitable person. High probability that I've met that. Not through me, but through your investigators. Ruben Aquino came out. His investigators came out. They interviewed me. They talked to me. Talked to my wife. Talked to my friends. Good moral character. All right, maybe not high probable, but <laughs> it's still there. They, no evidence from them to suggest otherwise. So that leaves A and D. Financial ability to provide continuous service. Mr. Freeman, or Trafton stated that he hasn't seen my unredacted financials. But that doesn't stop him from telling you I'm not financial, financially able. How does he come to that conclusion? A guess, a speculation, an assumption? He hasn't seen it. He should have no comment and move on. I think that's up to you guys. Do I have money in the bank? Can I provide reasonable services? High probability. I didn't produce any resumes into evidence. Yeah, true. I mean, I do have one resume, Mark Friedman. I told you that, you know, this thing, he was going, it was going along pretty well. He was going to do, he was going to be my GM. He was going to help me out. He's going to do this. Unexpected, his wife, his girlfriend, living girlfriend, partner dies. He just destroyed him. And we were getting ready to go to hearing in the summertime. He wasn't, he, he came to me, said, my mind's not there. I just let me take some time to do this. I said, Mark, I understand, you know. But at the same time, what am I supposed to do? I've already disclosed, according to your guys' orders, discovery cutoff, who's your witnesses, who's your exhibits, all that stuff. So I presented in direct testimony, again, evidence, that if I'm not sufficient to manage it, I have two people that will. And one of them I name Tony Bohr, my partner in LVL. You heard that directly from me. You've seen my financials from LVL, which include him as my partner, running a successful 
transportation company with 34 vehicles in it. 34 vehicles that cost more. Last time I checked, an Escalade costs more than a Camry. It's possible. Not only is it possible, it's being done. They talk about my income statement again. Um, I'm losing $50,000 here. I'm losing $400,000 here. They don't talk about the cross-examination I did. And I said, hey, you know, if you is depreciation expense really an, uh, an expense? No, it's a paper thing made up for your taxes. So I'm not writing a check for $290,000 every year to somebody called depreciation expense. That's just not what I'm doing. If I hire the mechanics, I've already included that in my maintenance costs. That's what George Balaban said. So I could take away the, that expense. If I run less times, run less uh, shifts, the variable costs go down as well as the revenue. Understandable. But to sit here and throw rocks at a glass house Fair. I think I asked for this stuff. Help me out. Let me see. And I said this in my deposition. You can ask Mr. Trafton's runners. I don't want to go into a business to lose money. That's all there's to it. I work hard for my money. So, hey, let me see your financials. No, it's not relevant. <laughs> Sitting in my chair now, listening to this, everything that they said is relevant. So that they just bamboozled me. They didn't give me what they said. So, He said there was no testimony or evidence other than these photographs of taxi lines. Incorrect. Mr. Constantino, Bell's road supervisor, came in and said, yeah, I see taxi lines all the time. People are standing there. I also see taxi cabs sitting there with no people. And I said, oh, it's kind of like an ebb and flow. She did exactly. There are times that demand exceeds the supply. And that according to Mr. Constantino, is not good. He said the better and the quicker we can move these passengers to their locations, the better. I admit, I haven't run a cab company. Never ran a cab company. Neither did anybody, neither did anybody until they became an owner. Need to wrap up, Carson. Huh? You need to wrap up. Thank you. In one of the most, uh, I guess, uh, strangest turns of events is that I objected to Mr. Awad presenting a closing argument or any kind of cross examination. Uh, but I'm glad you guys didn't listen to my thing because for the first time, first time in five days of hearings going through this. Finally, somebody admitted to the board, to the administrator, that I am fit to run a taxi cab company. Intervener, he's sitting here telling me right now, I am fit to run this company. I'm gonna piss off a lot of those guys over there, but he's here and that's his testimony. <laughs> as an intervener, who's opposing this application? He's at least throwing me a bone. <laughs> now, Mr. A. Watt said he supports diversity. Can you tell me how many? Uh, we're not in examination. I know, I'm just, I'm, I'm not rhetorical. Are there possible, are there any women, Latina, majority owned companies in the taxi cab industry? None. Well, that's not. Just so you know, Mr. Baylor just raised his hand behind there's, you. There's, there's no evidence about that Thank one way or the other. 
Ms. Hefner, my wife, gave her opening statement to you guys. And I kind of want to echo it just to, to be done is that she had a, a, a paragraph of her statement. It was called Her American Dream. And in that it says, we aspire to be the owners of a taxi cab company to one, support the demand for taxis in Southern Nevada. Two, contribute positively with the industry by reaching a higher level of service and professionalism. Three, to provide work opportunities to many. Four, to provide a far better product uh, than Uber, Lyft, and illegal operators. And five, to provide the opportunity of better lives for our families and the families of everyone involved. That, Mr. Awad, is why we want 35 medallions. Does anybody, can, can anybody agree with that? Can anybody disagree with that? Thank you for your time. I really want to thank um, all of your guys' time. I know it takes time and stuff out of your uh, regular schedule and stuff like that. But, uh, we think it's important or I wouldn't be here. So with that, we ask that you find that we are suitable and uh, grant us the application for CPCM. Thank you. So the matter is deemed submitted and I'll bring it back to the, to the board and ask for impressions. Mr. Chair, may I ask questions of the interveners or the applicant? Uh, we're not taking evidence, no. All right. Um, okay, so deliberation only? Deliberation. Right. I'm, I'm not trying to cut you off, but that sounds like we're taking reopening. Gotcha. Evidence. I got gotcha. you. Okay. That's fine. And the record supports. <clears throat> Sometime I'll have three minutes to explain that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Thompson would like to go now. He's, Do you want to go first? Sure, I guess. But, I can but, but we're not taking a vote yet. No, can, I, I'll explain. First, I, I wanted to uh, thank George Balaban, Ms. Gibbons, for their comments. I, I, I really value their knowledge of the taxi industry, particularly George he, he, or Mr. Balaban. He's been in various aspects of the taxi industry for over 50 years. And uh, I value his opinion. And he says that independent cab is going to have a tough pathway in front of them, really tough. So I really wouldn't want to be here too. But I, I've got to say both Carson and Hepner seem to be clever and intelligent people. So if I were a betting man, I would put my money on their surviving this and the company succeeding. Now, I really don't think they're going to turn a profit that first year, but then that's not surprising. And let me say that I'm one of the few people in this room who is not an attorney. And so it's difficult for me well, actually, it's baffling to understand the niceties of the legalisms that we've been talking about here today. And that's what you get when you have a nuclear physicist on the board. You know, I, <laughs> I really can't explain it more than that. Uh, I kind of, I try to think, what am I doing here? Why am I here and what is the purpose of my vote? And I was appointed by the governor and I think I am here for the benefit of the populace of Nevada. And as, as I've sat through my six years on this board, I've become convinced that the taxi companies are crucial to the happiness of Nevada. All of you, it's very important that you survive and you're healthy. Now, 
I will say that from a personal standpoint, I hope their company survives because they're nice people. I don't want to see them go through a bankruptcy and their lives falling apart. But from a board member, I don't think I should care because I don't think the survival of their company is important to the happiness of the population of Nevada. And I, I, I've been looking at what it, effect will it have on the present companies? Because I don't want it to have a bad effect on you. I want you to continue as you are and get even better. Because I think it's, I won't go into what I think the future of the public transport is, but you are important to our future in Nevada. And I, I don't think it's important whether they succeed or not. And let me let me give you just another 60 seconds of why I think that's true. There was a traumatic event in the history of the taxi industry three years ago, 2009, I believe it is, if people told me correctly. Frias, which is one of the major companies of taxis in Las Vegas, went out of business. They sold their assets. Oh my gosh. And in fact, yeah. it's kind of like the reverse of the independent cab not existing now and then existing in the future. I mean, if you think about the temporal reversal there, except it's fairly minor, 35 medallions versus however many free has had, it's on the order of 100 or so, it, it didn't seem to affect you financially dramatically when they existed before they went out of business. You dealt with them, okay? And so, well, there was COVID too. COVID <coughs> put a monkey wrench in everything. But the the slideshow that Mr. Carson showed, the interminable slideshow, toward the end, made a great argument for how healthy the tourist in industry is going to be in Las Vegas. Hence, the taxi industry is going to be healthy in Las Vegas. And in spite of what Mr. Awa has said, I think that's begun now. Uh, you can see things coming back together in Las Vegas. The airport, the, the casinos, et cetera. I think 2023 is going to be an even better year. So I don't think that there's going to be a, a, a massive upheaval, upheaval in the taxi industry. It's going to be better. And so for all of these reasons, I think that we should entertain the existence of independent cap. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, sure, Member Deck. I am concerned about a couple things. Um, number one, I'm concerned about unfair barriers to entry. Um, both the reality of that and the perception of that. Um, I think the perception might already exist, uh, whether warranted or not. Um, that's one of the things I'm concerned about. I, I will tell you, I was the administrator of this agency for over a year post-COVID, and um, unfortunately, Mr. Awad did not discuss the specific COVID recovery um, items that he mentioned um, that uh, prevented him from supporting the application. But I will tell you, as the administrator of this agency, I gave at least a dozen interviews to the press to uh, explain the, um, the the industry not meeting the needs of the public. Now, things have changed, and I haven't been the administrator for a minute, so um, I'm not exactly sure where we are on that. But I do agree with Mr. Thompson that um, tourism is up, record numbers, visitorship is up. Um, I do I do find that there would be competition by granting this application. I do not find that that comp competition would be detrimental um, to the existing uh, certificate holders. In fact, it might be completely irrelevant. Um, 
the impact to um, the public would also be not sufficiently adverse um, by granting the application. Um, a number of people in this room uh, during this hearing stated um, that the that Las Vegas needs more cabs, but not more companies. Um, so theoretically, the need is there, and 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 uh, interveners have admitted that more cabs are necessary. Um, the idea that they don't want any more companies, I understand, but that again, that that's a bit of a concern of mine. So what that leaves under the statute, in my mind, is with whether Mr. Carson um, is fit, willing, and able. He's clearly willing. Um, I would argue that he's fit um, for as long as he can capitalize a company, whether it's profitable or not. If it's losing money and he has the capital capital to subsidize it for as long as it takes for it to become profitable, then theoretically he's fit. Um, so the question that leaves the question: Is he able? Um, and that's where I'm struggling. Um, is he able to run a cab company? Um, I think it's questionable as if he understands ri the risks um, and is reasonably, reasonably prepared for those risks. He mentioned in his closing that he didn't want to risk his personal uh, wealth, I'll just say, not, not his words. Um, but I, I would argue that you absolutely are. Um, so I think you should um, be perfectly aware that you absolutely are risking your personal wealth. Um, he operates a transportation company currently. He has some experience in the industry as a lawyer. Um, I think he's probably as capable as anyone other than um, someone who is currently a GM or a cab owner, a uh, cab company owner. Um, and if, he, as he mentioned, if he's not, who is? Um, so my next concern goes to the impact on the industry of uh, one of three things. One, that happened. These are the only three things that can happen. One is we deny his application, and we all go home. Second thing is we grant his uh, application, and he runs a successful company, and there is an impact to the existing certificate holders because of that. Uh, three is. Uh, we grant him his application and his company fails and he goes into bankruptcy and he goes out of business and there is an impact to the existing certificate holders and the industry and the perception of the industry. One of those three things is the only outcome. Um, so I go to consideration of the impact on the public and the industry if his company fails, as the interveners have argued that he is likely to do, and that kind of my mind becomes the primary consideration as to whether or not he has the right to be granted a permit. Um, and I would argue that Las Vegas probably doesn't need another French bakery. But if anybody in this room wanted to open one, they shouldn't necessarily be barred from doing so um, because this is a free market. Uh, and I might go try that French bakery. And I'm and so do we, uh, if Mr. Car Carson wants to do what, uh, and I'm being flippant and, and no offense to anybody, but if Mr. Carson wants to um, do what the interveners might characterize as build a money fire, um, if there is minimal impact to the industry and the marketplace from a regulatory standpoint, do we have the right to tell him he cannot do that? And I'm not sure that's true. Um, so what are those impacts? Uh, those three outcomes. Well, there's comp the, the negative impacts, which I asked a couple of the interveners specifically, what would be the negative impacts of his company failing? Amounted to, um, if he was granted a permit, he would compete with us for drivers. Well, that competition already exists amongst the existing certificate holders, so that's irrelevant to me because you are already poaching each other's drivers. Another 35 is, if that's going to literally impact your operations, we probably need to talk about solvency, and, and, and I can review, <laughs> I can review some of the financials uh, with the tax cab authority. But to me, that seems negligible. Next thing is, he might, if he's hurting for money, if he's not solvent, uh, he might become a safety risk by taking shortcuts. Um, anybody might do that. Existing certificate holders could run at a loss and might take shortcuts. That's what the taxicab authorities for, that's what the 
uh, Administrator Armstrong's people, pe people do. Having formally run that agency, I'm not worried about that happening um, or, or any company getting away with those kinds of things. Um, industry reputation might be tarnished. Well, the industry reputation might also be tarnished if we were perceived as um, upholding unfair barriers to entry. I think that reputational risk is probably greater than a very small um, boutique company being granted a certificate and and not making it. Um, I agree with uh, Member Thompson that whether Mr. Carson succeeds or fails personally is not the board's concern, but the impact to the existing certificate holders and the public is. Um, so I'm uh, in the interest of the taxi industry, um, which used to be the standard for ground transportation, and now you could argue is a niche. Uh, it, it has a niche um, focus. The Golden Triangle, we like to say that because that's the area that we've, that, that the industry thrives while Uber and Lyft and the TNCs, you know, have tens of thousands of more rides uh, than we do. Um, the way to address that is to put more cabs on the road, and I tend to um, lean towards granting the application. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree with uh, some of my fellow members. Um, we have a standard. It's a five point standard. As the applicant has told us, the applicant is responsible for meeting not some, but all of those five uh, standards. And really, with a lot of hours uh, spent before us, has not done much to do any of them. Um, I think I know from these hearings that Las Vegas is booming again. And we've survived COVID, but we also know from our own experience and the own statistics that the administrator gives us, the taxi cab company is not booming at the same rate that the airport is, that construction is, that the gaming industry is. For the first time in essentially my experience is being a Las Vega. So can we on our own find D or C? C is typically the one that most of these cases go by. Everyone that I've had from the Public Service Commission, when my first case was Mr. Balaban's limo company, to the water cases I had at the Utilities Commission, to the charter bus cases I had at the, the agency that was the predecessor to the NTA, the Transportation Services Authority, it usually centers around C. Will the certificate not unreasonably and adversely affect the other carriers? And you rarely get good evidence on that. And when we came into this hearing, I read the packet and I said, well, okay. You know, you almost assume that the applicant knows what they're doing. Every case I've had, there's been somebody who has experience in that business before you. Maybe not at the general manager level, but there's always been somebody. Um, so I come into the hearing and I said, oh, we have an economic witness. Great. Finally going to hear that. It's not an easy question to answer. And Mr. Bonifat tells us he was specifically not told to address that question. And I'm like, what? I've got an experienced lawyer here who told his lawyer, excuse me, his economist, not to answer the key element of the case. Well, why not? You paid him anyway. So I don't know what Mr. Bonifat told us. So I was very frustrated at that point. But then we went through the frustrating exercise of the interveners ripping apart an application and largely a pro forma. And I have to say that is still excruciating after all these years. It's just <laughs> rude. You feel sorry for the applicant and you don't like it. It's just, it's not a great process. But what it does, a pro forma, yes, it is assumptions. It is projections, but it's essentially a business plan. And by testing that, you find out if the applicants generally know what they're talking about. When my first transportation case, Mr. Balaban was before me, both he, I, and Mr. Winter had a lot darker hair. <laughs> and Mr. Balaban was up uh, on the witness stand. 
and the other interveners who are largely the taxi cab limo business at the time in Las Vegas, I think Mr. Balaban's company was the only one who didn't have a limo certificate at the time, were basically trying to rip apart his performer. What I remember from that is he could answer every question. Sometimes he corrected the lawyer, and the lawyer would have to go over to their client, whisper, and then, okay, like that. I mean, he, he was tripping up the people who were trying to trip him up. He knew what he was talking about. And great, and he was granted that certificate. Um, and I flash forward to today, and this is the first time I get the feeling that the applicant really does not know how to operate a taxi cab company. Our own regulations say that somebody should have sufficient experience. What sufficient experience? I don't know that we have that, but it's got to be something. And practicing before this agency or the NTA is not experience. I represented developers for a lot of my life. I would not even try to build a shed in my backyard. <laughs> I regulated utilities, and you will not see me as a developer of any power plants. It just being a lawyer for an industry doesn't mean you know the industry. Um, the applicant said in his closing arguments that, well, how do you get a general manager? Everybody back behind me is a general manager, and they weren't a general manager before they got that. And I kind of looked at them, how those people have been in that industry longer than I've been in any business? They all grew up in it their entire professional lives. That's how they became general managers. You don't have to be a general manager to be the general manager for a UCAP company, but you got to have somebody who kind of knows what's going on, not somebody who's doing double duty with a, a busy law practice or any other practice. So I hate to say this, and I don't mean to be insulting, I don't believe this applicant is fit. And we don't have any evidence really on pretty much B, C, D, or E. I guess I could get, I could get to C uh, because we know that I, I just, my hunch is another 35 medallions aren't going to really hurt the existing industry. Uh, so I could get to there, but I, I just can't get over the threshold issue. When I walked in this hearing, I thought we wouldn't even be discussing that. Then I, something happened at hearing in August that really threw me. And I had a lot of discussions with our former Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Bala, about this. The applicant and the lawyer. Now, normally, you don't blame an applicant or a party for the mistakes of a lawyer. But when they're the same person, actions as a lawyer, are they, is, this, is this reflective of what the actions are going to be like as a, as a certificate holder? The applicant testified under oath that the administrator of this agency directed him not to give revised versions of his application to the parties. We heard very quickly that that was an untrue statement. Later, uh, the applicant apologized for a misunderstanding. And I left that hearing trying to remember way back when I took the ethics portion of the bar. One, if it was a lie, it was a lie, and that's horrible. And right there, should be just, the application should have been dismissed. But if it wasn't a lie, if it was a misunderstanding, I think it's pretty simple. I know it is under the legal ethics, but I think it is in the ethics of the rest of the board. When you're told to do something that is unethical by someone of authority, you don't do it. You're not supposed to do it. You ask for clarification. You go over their head, but you just don't do it. So I talked with Mr. Bala about this. And we had a very long conversation, a couple of them. And he expressed to me, that under the current model rules of ethics, the representation under oath that he was told specifically not to give that portion of the application to the other parties would be a could be a violation of 3.3. I say could be. We didn't get into this enough to be conclusive, and that's not our job under the Candidate Tribunal, because clearly it was a misrepresentation of what actually happened to us that day. Now, Later, we say that it might have been a misunderstanding, but there is, under the model rules 3.4, fairness to the other parties. That was obviously unfair to the other parties. An attorney that has practiced presumably all these years before this agency and similar agencies that has been on the other end of it 
should have known. A first year law student should have known you don't do that. It was unethical, even if you misunderstood the administrator. So I finally asked Mr. Bell, I said, well, what does that do? How does that fit the standard? He goes, well, member Soderberg, veracity goes to fitness. Even if you found this person was a fit operator, if you believe that there's a potential ethical violation, you can find them unfit for this alone. It was a pause. I was a little surprised by it, but I went, okay. And that was it. Now, Mr. Bell is no longer our legal counsel. I'm not re-asking the question again to our new legal counsel. But if I could find that this applicant knew how to operate or had any chance of success in a cab company, I still would find them unfit because of what went on in August. That I can't get over it. So in short, I don't feel we can find this applicant has met the standards outlined in the statute. We might get close on one or two, but we can't get close to all five, and I can't get close to fitness. Mr. Chairman, if it is this board's um, you know, desire to grant this application, I would probably make a motion for some amendments, but I don't know that I want to do that now. Um, quite frankly, it looks like the, the applicants got one vote and maybe a second vote and then a no vote, but it takes three. So I think <laughs> your discussion is pretty important right now, and maybe I don't need to bring amendments. Okay. Um, there's a few points that I will begin with where I think um, some clarity uh, on some positions that both parties have taken is important. The first is that Mr. Carson, on behalf of Independent, has taken repeatedly the position that there's no Nevada law requiring the submission of a pro forma or a business plan to obtain a CPC. That is a patently false statement. NAC 706-903 requires a CPCN applicant to submit that information to the authority as a required part of the application. And those business plans and pro formas in any other regulated industry in that are part of either suitability, fitness, whatever standard is applied by the Commissioner of Financial Institutions, the Gaming Commission, the Public Utility Commission. It's not novel that you have to give a business plan and that you have to give a pro forma. So I just will tell you at the very beginning, I am troubled by that position, and it is not a position I will accept legally. Secondly, the interveners assert that the board only has the power, and this is my interpretation of the interveners' position, the board only has the power to grant a CPCN if the holders of the existing certificates will not meet the needs of the territory for which the certificate is sought, if the certificate is not granted. I think that seriously misconstrues the statute. And like Mr. Soderbergh, I had a lengthy conversation with our former DAG on this point. That statute states that if that situation exists, inadequate service, and the board finds all of the other requirements of that provision of law, we must grant the certificate. We can't refuse to. Um, it's a shall. And the Nevada legislature says that's a duty to act. It doesn't say that if that fact, inadequate service, is not proven, that we may not. It doesn't take our discretion away. It's just a statute that says when we don't have discretion anymore. 
And the third, and here I'm probably going to differ seriously with my colleague, Mr. Decker. The argument that I got certificates from the Transportation Authority for a limo, bus, or anything else is an argument for administrative race judicata which in the state of Nevada is a very well-defined concept. And Mr. Carson did not prove the elements of administrative race judicata. So the record, I will outline those. Under the Utah construction case, there are some initial inquiries. Did the agency, and we're now talking about the TA, act in a judicial capacity? May have. Did the parties have an adequate opportunity to litigate that was timely and adequately noticed in that other proceeding? Did they have the right to be heard and offer evidence? Or was it a cursory or stipulated result? Was there a true evidentiary process in that other case? And was the decision made by an impartial party based on evidence introduced at the hearing? Not saying that the TA wouldn't have been impartial, but there's no evidence in front of us about what kind of a proceeding was had in front of the TA. And finally, did the agency have jurisdiction or power? Yes, the TA would have had that power. If we find those Utah construction elements, then we go to the next step, which is, is there a final decision in the TA on the merits? No final decision on the merits was ever presented to us. The second is, was the issue decided in the prior case identical to the issue presented in the current dispute? I can say categorically it was not. It's under a different statutory scheme. So whether evidence was presented or not, that element couldn't be proven. And third, did the party against whom the results of the final decision will be applied? Is a party in this proceeding and was a party in that proceeding or were closely affiliated? And therefore, we can fairly apply that. There's no evidence in front of us on that point. So as to the case law on administrative res judicata, and I'll cite Britain versus City of Las Vegas, 106 Nevada, 690, Roberts versus Las Vegas Water District, 849 Fed Sup, 1393, applying Nevada law, Campbell versus State XREL, Department of Taxation, 108 Nevada, 215, Jerry's Nugget versus Keith, 111 Nevada, 49, and United States versus Utah Construction and Mining Company, 384 U.S. 384. It is my conclusion that whatever the TA did, the TA did, but the evidence wasn't presented to us for us to give that part of the fitness evidence that Mr. Carson wanted us to consider legal recognition in this case. That said, I believe the record is abundantly clear on some of the factors that Mr. Carson had to prove by clear and convincing. There is no evidence of conviction in the confidential records or a crime of moral turpitude. There is no evidence that Mr. Carson and Ms. Heppner are associated with organized crime or any other unsuitable person, and we all know what that statute is about. I'm sorry, that NAC. There is no evidence that they are not of good moral character. So that is not the part of fitness, unlike my colleague, Mr. Soderbergh, or Member Soderbergh, that I am worried about. On the clear and convincing standard under NAC 706-453, I can't 
it's a bridge too far for me, Mr. Carson, that you've proved clear and convincing. Long before I did just regulatory work, I was a trial lawyer, I was putting people in prison, I was trying cases on behalf of the state where I had to apply clear and convincing evidence to get something done on behalf of the government. And I know clear and convincing evidence when I see it. And there is no, in my view, clear and convincing evidence of financial ability in this case to provide continuous service. And I will, without saying anything more, say I have read all of the confidential financial information. And I say that because I give a great deal of credence to the evidence that you're going to bleed when you open this business. And you're entitled to bleed. But how long can you bleed? And I kind of think I figured out how long you can bleed. And you're not going to be able to provide continuous service. That's my humble opinion with the capitalization that is available. I also have to say on 706-453-1D, I do not believe you've proven by clear and convincing evidence sufficient experience. You certainly haven't demonstrated employment by your own admission of a person with sufficient experience to properly manage a taxi cab company. I appreciate you've been practicing law in front of these regulatory agencies. Being a lawyer, don't make a manager. But I'm also going to say this. I reject out of hand the inference the industry wants me to take, which is you've got to be somebody who's run a cab company before to prove this element. There are people who get gaming licenses. There are people who get banking licenses. There are people who get to run water companies and sewer companies who've never been in that business. Now, what they do bring to the table, which you have not brought to the table in my view, is a management team. Half a dozen MBAs who've run a bunch of different industries, know how to go out and raise capital, know how this industry works, that industry, and they'll sit down in a hearing and they will tell you everything they've learned about the industry they now want a license for and how they're going to pull it off. And they're going to give me the kinds of data you did not give us. It's not adequate evidence to say I had a telephone call and I can buy these cars for that. There needed to be documentation. There needed to be documentation of how you were going to borrow the money to do this. There needed to be documentation of where you're going to actually operate this business. Not I might do it this way or I might do it that way. I'm actually going to agree with some of the intervener testimony. I thought when I walked in the hearing room the very first day, what he's going to present me is having read the financial data, I'm going to take my limo company and I'm going to use it as a springboard and I'm going to collateralize it. And I've already got everybody on board for that and this is how I'm going to do it. And here's the experience they have. I never heard that. What I heard is I might do that. I might not do that. It's neither clear and convincing evidence nor is it even a preponderance to say I might do that. The argument you made that fell on deaf ears for me was, well, I'm not going to incur any of these expenses. I'm not going to even incur the expense of getting bids or estimates, documentation for the board to look at. Before I get the CPCM, that would be a wholly unique position in my experience as a regulatory board. You do not go to the gaming commission and say, I'm going to build a casino. 
but when you give me the license, I'll go get the $500 million to do that. The $500 million, there better be that money in the bank. You want a banking charter in the state? You better have $40 million in the bank. You better already hired your bank manager. You better already have the bank location because you have to have a business plan that says how you're going to serve the community where that business branch is. So, you know, it's not unique. Um, you know, if I want to set up a, a water or a sewer company, I don't say, give me the certificate and then I'll go get the water rights. And then I'll build the sewer plant. It's, you either have got the plans on the board and you've got the money to do it before I give you the certificate. And that's not a unique concept in Nevada law. And it shouldn't be unique in this context either. Um, so I'm, I, I'm very troubled. I, I was very troubled and still am and do not believe that you overcame, you've proven by clear and convincing evidence your financial ability or that there's sufficient experience in this company uh, to, to operate. Do I believe in my heart you could? Yeah, I believe the two of you have the ability to put together an application to do that. You just didn't do it. And I don't know why you didn't do it. Um, Mr. Winter speculates that you want a CPCN but not to operate a company. There's no evidence of that. Um, but, but certainly I might draw that inference to, on the evidence here that you did the bare minimum to maybe try to get a CPCN that you would then market. Um, I will say if that were the business plan, that is detrimental to the state of Nevada and to the industry. This board should not be granting CPCNs for arbitrage. That would be um, a black eye for the state of Nevada. Um, we should be only granting CPCNs to people who are going to go into business and pursue taking care of the travel um, On the standards of 8826, well, let me just comment on, because everybody's talked about NRS 706-151. Wonderful statute. It's a legislative declaration of policy. It provides guide rails on how we should be doing something. And if we were to grant a certificate that would violate some of these things, like giving you some special uh, benefit that no other company had or by ignoring a regulation or a statute, then we'd fall prey to a 151 issue. But I don't, I don't personally see 151 as a major point here. On 8827 sub 2, a through E. Um, I have already said B doesn't, it's just 706, 151 is just guardrail. So I set aside B. Um, the first is that you are fit, willing, and able to perform the services. I believe you have personal fitness in spades. Um, I don't believe that you demonstrated for the reasons I've already stated on financial ability and management ability, that you are fit to operate without somebody else. Because being a lawyer in the industry, just as Member Soderberg said, doesn't make you a manager of the industry. Practiced regulatory law for 40 years, both in and out of the government. I would never pretend that I could run a casino, a bank, uh, a public utility. I know how to represent them in hearing them, but I wouldn't pretend I know how to run those companies. Uh, nor would I be so bold as to say that actually to a regular. Um, but the term fitness, willingness, and ability are, and I use this term in the legal sense, those of us who 
went to law school a long time ago, are pregnant with meaning. Um, they, fitness doesn't just mean that you're honest. Fitness means you're able to do this uh, from a uh, the standpoint of commercial competence, not just probity, but acumen. Willingness doesn't mean, sure, I really want to do this. I have a passion for it. Willing means I've got the capital. I've got the commitments. I've got the documentation to prove I have the ability. They want to turn the switch if I am given a CPC. And ability is, as I've said a couple times, more than just I've represented the industry. It's a, the ability to actually manage and operate the thing you want to operate. Um, and I am not convinced you've even proven by a preponderance that you're fit, willing, and able. Uh, except for I believe you've proven by far more than a preponderance your, both of your personal characters. I, I, I have no concerns whatsoever there. Um, now I get to the industry's position on 2C, D, and E. C is granting the certificate will not unreasonably and adversely affect other carriers. Um, I concur with Member Decker. I, I can't say that you haven't established by preponderance that there's not going to be an unreasonable or adverse effect for 35 medallions. The fact that there's going to be more competition is not a bad thing. And the legislature amended this, the statute to tell us that we should be not using competition as a pure basis for um, for not granting a certificate. Um, so there's going to be competition for drivers. There's competition for drivers today. There will be if and when you bring back a proper application fully uh, formed uh, to get a certificate. That, that to me is not an issue. This D, the holders of the existing certificates will not meet the needs of the territory. I've already stated. I dismiss that one. That is only if I am only required to give the certificate if I make that finding. I don't find that they're not meeting the needs, nor am I finding that they're meeting the needs. And here, I'm just going to say we're in a period of, of intermodal transportation disruption. And it's not over. It's going to continue. Um, and to a certain extent, God, I hope we get back to 27 million rides, but I'm not sure we ever will because there's a, there's a disruption and that's, uh, the TNCs and they're not going to go away. Um, they've shown that they're not going to go away. They'll subsidize themselves for whatever purposes, if it's just delivering food, um, but that disruption, frankly, nobody presented any evidence in this hearing room as to whether more medallions or fewer medallions is going to fix that problem. Because the only way for the taxi cab or a taxi cab industry to fix that problem is to meet the TMCs at their own game. And the industry hasn't yet developed the technology or implemented the technology. And I'm not, that's not accusatory. It's just not there yet. Um, hopefully, the board can help in the future to get to that. Um, so I get to finally, will the proposed service benefit the public and the taxi cab business in the territory served? I believe you proved that particular element. 39 more medallions, or 35 more medallions, I frankly don't think it's going to change the, the meeting. 
and while um, you, what, while I wouldn't want you to go bankrupt, um, if you were to go bankrupt, I also don't think that 35 medallions falling out of the system is going to do harm to the rest of the uh, industry. Um, when Frius did, you know, its blow up, did we move on? Yeah, we moved on. Um, I mean, if your company were to blow up, I don't think that would be. Any. To a certain extent, I agree with Member Decker. You have the right, at a certain level, to go into the business if you prove the elements you have to prove it, all of those elements, which you have not. Um, you have the right to take your shot and see if you can't build the next 250, 350, uh, you know, medallion company. That's that's your that that is a right that the statute gives you to do. But you have to prove the elements to get there, and I don't believe you've done that. So for those reasons, I cannot support this application in the form it's in. I do want to say this. Um, I have been, the one thing that I have wrung my hands about is we have the power to impose a bucket load of conditions on a certificate to let, to, to put guardrails on giving somebody that certificate. Um, and I want you to know that I have literally spent probably three or four hours, maybe that's not enough time for the chairman of the board, trying to figure out, could I craft those kinds of conditions in a way that makes sure that by the time you got your CPCN activated, you were in proper financial and managerial state to run the company. And I concluded that because I am so brilliant, I could come up with those conditions, but they would put a huge, a huge burden on the administrator and the agency, which actually the statutory scheme is said is our burden. And that burden is to make the tough call as to whether to grant CPC. And so at the end of the day, um, I walked away from that consideration because um, I'd love to grant the CPCN to a, somebody who's made out all of the elements because I agree with Member Decker. We have to be not, we, we can't be a barrier to entry that only, take no, no offense people, that only the good old boys that are already there get to keep and the good old gals. Um, that, that's not what the statutory scheme's about, but um, trying to craft conditions, I can't, it's a bridge too far. So those are my thoughts. Um, Mr. Chair, I um, also reviewed uh, 706 for conditional provisions, which many other chapters of law and other regulatory schemes have. And there aren't any specific provisions. Um, I will say there were a number of times um, during the testimony of the interveners, specifically um, industry experts, in which I found myself personally worried for Mr. Carson and his personal wealth. <laughs> and I found myself trying to figure out how he was not as worried as I was. And what occurred to me is, uh, and one of the questions that I mentioned that I might want to ask uh, uh, when we, uh, after closings, which we didn't have the opportunity to do, was going to be, and I'll ask it of you because we're deliberating, is there any value to a CPCN for someone who wants to possess it but not operate a cab company, as Mr. Winter mentioned. Because the minute he said that, I turned to my notes in which I had written that down as a question that I, as a former administrator and as a board member, don't know if 
there's any value. And so I was uh, curious as to. Um, I think as I, so I think you're propounding that question. I, I am, yes. Um, I, I think I've answered that in part, but maybe you didn't get that I was, that was the question I was answering. I, I, well, I did. I, I, just, I, I, I don't, don't believe. I don't believe that we should grant CPCMs for speculative purposes. I absolutely agree with you. And it occurred to me that maybe there was um, less concern for the financials and the testimony of the interveners that the uh, that the pro forma was inadequate because possibly there was an intent to um, to possess the CPCM and for its own value other than using it to run a cap company. That occurred to me. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question if there is any value. Um, and I didn't get a chance to ask it to the interveners, but it, it did occur to me a number of times to the point where I wrote it down. And when Mr. Winter said uh, what he said, um, I found it in my notes where that was on my list of concerns um, because there was enough testimony from the interveners to worry uh, about the numbers, to, to worry me on behalf of the applicant. The, the other, not only the speculation issue, the other issue that I have is as I read the statutory scheme, I don't see that the legislature's telling us to go grant CPCMs that have no value to the traveling public. Um, I mean, that a, a CPCM granted under some set of conditions that it can't be used until you do X, Y, and Z, doesn't add one cab to serve the traveling public. Um, and I, so I think rightfully, um, because the administrator and I seem to be the ones that get called before the legislative committees, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to have to explain to a legislator Oh yeah, we have came up with this new category of CPCM, but you don't have to actually operate a company. Well, and I think most regulatory chapters include the authority to grant conditional yeah. or provisional right. certificates, and there's probably a reason that 706 doesn't. Yeah. Other thoughts? Uh, if there's not any other thoughts or discussion, then I believe we're in a position for a motion. Um, might be an interesting outcome, but you know, I would okay. entertain a motion if somebody would like to make it. Mr. Chairman, let me ask you before we do a motion. I think we have uh, two members that don't want to grant this um, item and two that do. So should I should the proper form of the motion be a motion to grant the certificate, knowing that I'm making the motion and voting no, or should I make a motion to deny the certificate? I haven't done this in a long time. I don't know if we put it's it in the negative. It. I know my vote is in the negative, but I don't want to do this wrong, or maybe so I, the I, vice I, chairman should make a motion to approve since he's told us he would like to do that, and then we can go from there. Um, or you can make a motion in whatever form you want to, and if it doesn't carry, then um, another motion would be required. Well, okay. Does let that me, make sense? Well, there's four of us. Yes. <laughs> we could be two, two. We could. Could be. So I guess if I make a motion to grant the application, and I, we've got the DAG up there, you're on the screen now, we can see you. Um, yeah, I've been so here the whole time to... listening. I just figured now I might actually <laughs> I have something to say. Yeah, okay. So here's the here's the question to you. If yeah, I I've make been a listening. motion, what I would do is to grant the application motion. and that motion yeah. fails, are we done? Okay. That's what I would We're do. Talking. Instead of making the motion in the negative and then remaking a motion in the affirmative, make the motion in the affirmative of granting and then if it fails it fails and there you go the motion okay. fails with a tie vote yeah. shall i shall i make the motion then you may yeah a tie vote is not an approval it has to have three votes majority okay i will make a motion that we approve the acceptance of independent cab as a cab company 
Second. Second. Uh, and therefore grant the application. And grant the application, yes. Will you take that on there? I second the addendum. Um, discussion on the motion. Mr. Chairman, my comments stand. It's uh, not a personal reflection. I think we've heard from a number of people that the applicants are, are nice people. And um, that's just unfortunately not something that we're to consider. And so um, I hate talking negative about people and it was very uncomfortable for me, but at the end of the day, the statute doesn't have a nice person uh, standard. And so I think they leave here Everybody's saying that they're nice people and we hope everything goes well for them, but I will be voting no. Yeah. Question to the deputy AG before we uh, take a vote. So a 2-2 two -two vote, what is the effect on the application? The 2-2 two -two vote is not granting the application and has to be a majority. Right, so it's neither granted nor denied. I'm not sure if there's another avenue besides granting or denying. It's either granted or denied, and if it's not granted by a majority vote, seems to me that's a denial. Okay. I would add uh, for comments on the motion um, that my inclination, my inclina I'm, I'm very worried about the ability um, of the applicants to maintain continuous service. I think that was made clear by the industry experts. However, I tend to lead in favor of um, a marketplace in which people can figure that out for themselves. My concern is, is there a significant impact to the industry or the public? And I think probably there isn't. And I also probably think that Mr. Carson might thank his lucky stars in the future that he was granted this application, but my, I, I would vote to approve it. May, may I ask a question? Sure. If they are denied, can they resubmit with an easy application? With a what? They would have to submit and, a new application yeah, new within 180 one. days yeah, can, after, at, okay, this, they, if this they is denied, have, they would have to wait six months before a new application could be presented to the authority. Right. They're, timed, they're timed out for 180 days, but then they can file a new application. All right. Any further discussion on the motion? The motion has been made to uh, grant the application. It's been seconded. All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those against. Against, uh, no. I want to, uh, before we go off the record, um, at least from my uh, perspective, thank all of council for their preparation, their energy, um, the very um, long and tortured path that you all went through, which um, uh, as publicly stated, I hope we do not repeat uh, in the future. Um, and you know, the administrator and I will try to make that uh, so that that's not the situation uh, on a new application. But I appreciate the professionalism uh, and everybody's preparation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait. No, we will not stand again. Uh oh. Final item. Uh, before we adjourn is public comment. This time is set aside on our agenda for members of the public who wish to address the board on matters within its jurisdiction or action may be taken on those matters. Um, and we'd ask any member of the public who wishes to address us to try to limit their time to three minutes. Is there any member of the public who would wish to uh, make comments to the board? Final order of business. We usually have our monthly meeting commencing at 9.30, but it is at 9 tomorrow because we are evicted from the room. Uh, so uh, soon. I'm sorry, uh, gentlemen, yeah. can you repeat that? I'm hearing a lot of frosting with papers and clips. What, what was the schedule for tomorrow, 9 o'clock again? Uh, tomorrow is our regularly scheduled monthly meeting which is usually scheduled at 9.30, but it is at 9 
because we uh, have a room facility problem tomorrow. It's the same link. Yes. The same link, yes. All right, then I will see you guys tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.